This is Five Minute Friday. This is going to be 11 lessons I've learned from four years as a digital nomad. I've spent the last four years living around the world as a business coach in Asia, Europe, North America, probably at least 20 different countries. And here are some things that I've learned and observed and some rants about the state of the world and work, the work that we do. Uh, these are things I've observed and what I've learned from my fellow nomads and people that I coach. So number one, I have seen that developing countries, countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Ukraine, and Hungary, while they still have a very low wage and a low cost of living, are very optimistic and they are thinking big and so many people, including like 60% of people in Vietnam, have a they're, they're entrepreneurs they have a side gig at least or that is their main income is their business so you know anything from buying and selling pineapples on the street to creating apps to developing large organizations that deliver food uh i've seen i've seen a lot of progress in these developing countries and i think that's where we're going to see a lot of growth Number two, we don't need borders. In the United States, obviously, you can cross the country without having to have a border control at the States. And in Europe, within the Schengen zone, you can pass freely. And the rest of the time, when you're going from country to country, border controls just seem ridiculous. And we know that there is massive human migration happening from, from conflict, from climate-related refugees, and people are going to be moving across borders, whether there are border controls or not, uh, including into the United States from Mexico. It happens, and it'll continue happening. And so we just need to figure out a better system. Borders, uh, I think, are probably an outdated construct. Along with that is number three, is that smaller governmental entities are better at serving people. So we're talking neighborhood level government, city level government. These people like mayors can actually enact change. So if a mayor, someone goes to the mayor and says, hey, my, the street lights are out on my street. He can send the city engineers over there and they can fix it. Things can happen very quickly. They can repave potholes in streets. The Banjar system in Bali, for example, it would be within a village all of the it's it's all the married men actually who control the power so it's not completely sexist friendly but they can make a decision together and then immediately start construction on a new project uh that same day and so things happen much more quickly and because so many people live in cities the if all cities banded together to work on a problem like say energy efficiency or emissions they could make a huge difference. And we've also seen that uh, this, this leads to greater happiness. So, so the happiness of places like Switzerland, where they're still operating more autonomously uh, with a city-state-like system, can be very effective. So national governments are much more unwieldy and smaller neighborhood and city governments can, can move much more quickly and serve their people better, I think. When it comes to cities, number four, they can effectively compete for the best people to live there. So because so many people will be moving to location independence, cities have this great opportunity to attract the, the best minds, the best talent, the wealthy location independent entrepreneurs to them. So they want to treat them well. They want to create situations, environments that are enticing. And they also want to give them uh, tax breaks for starting business there. The, the motto, go where you are treated best, uh, was put forth by the nomad capitalist, Andrew Henderson. Check out his podcast. It's very interesting. And yeah, basically because so many people will be able to choose where they live, cities are going to be the, not necessarily countries, but cities are going to be the ones competing to have these people there living and spending their money. So number five, because people can work anywhere they want doesn't necessarily mean that they will. And a lot of people are still held back by some kind of convention or they're uncomfortable. They, or they don't want to leave their community that they have, you know, it's either, it's either they're very comfortable where they are. Maybe they have a garden in a nice community and they don't want to leave, even though they can work remotely or it's because they're afraid of other cultures or they're afraid of change and they're not willing to be uncomfortable. Number six, in a global marketplace, when you are competing, say you're a graphic designer, there are 
millions of graphic designers around the world, and many of them are in developing countries and willing to work much harder and much cheaper than you are. So don't try to compete with them. If you do, it's not going to work. And it's also very hard to establish your hierarchy in a marketplace of 100,000 or a million graphic designers. It's, it's easy for us to understand in a tribe, for example, where we fit in in the hierarchy. Here's the chief, here's you know, the important people in the village, and here's like where I am in the middle of the village. But with that many people, our brains just can't wrap around like who's better and who's worse and what price we should be charging. So you have to make your market small enough so that you are the only one or so that you're the very top of your market. So if you're a graphic designer, maybe you go very, very specific and you say, I'm a graphic designer for international yoga teachers that lead yoga retreats. And there's lots of those and you can be the number one graphic designer for that and you don't have to compete anymore. You can just be the top of your field. Okay, number seven is control and autonomy over your work leads to happiness. And people spend so much time in their jobs and they, a lot of them feel like they're stuck, which is why they move to location independence in the first place. But if you're still spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week trying to grow a location independent business, you're still missing out on some of that control. So you need to increase your skills and you need to increase skills that won't be replaced by automation. They won't be able to be outsourced or competed from somewhere who's willing to work cheaper. They need to be distinctly human characteristics. And I talk about this in my book, upcoming book, Superconductors, things like being able to uh, organize a group of people around a cause or being able to learn something quickly or creative problem solving, things like that that can add to your existing technical skills in your specific field. Number eight, I've noticed that currencies don't appear to be working that well because there's so much fluctuation and the inflation when my buying power goes down by 30% in three months, so the US dollar has gone down compared to the euro and the countries in Europe where I'm living in the last three months, I'm effectively losing a ton of money, but I have no control over that. And it feels very disempowering and it, and it seems ridiculous that some government policy or my country's economy is really going to influence my own particular value because the the work that I'm doing, the value is the same to the people who are being coached by me. So Bitcoin might be the answer, cryptocurrency, you know, potentially figuring out a good way to do the barter system again might work. Uh, it's very it's a very tricky problem, but as I see it, as existing countries, especially if you have a high rate of inflation, you might be a millionaire right now, but your kids might get nothing because you might be totally priced out by inflation. So that needs to that needs to be fixed and you need to hedge your bets by having value in multiple areas. Number 9. Uh I've learned that people don't need a lot of possessions. The average number of possessions that an American household has in it like this is the average, right? Is 300,000 objects in your house. And pr right now I'm looking around on my desk there's probably hundreds of objects. <laughs> pens pencils who knows you know all of these th little things we have so much stuff and i did just fine living out of a 40 liter carry-on bag for two years now i have actually two pieces of luggage so it's twice as much as that but if you love every possession you have all of the clothes you have then you're willing to wear them over and over again and you don't really need much now i understand that minimalism is a privilege right if you need to buy something then you can. And so it's a privilege of people to have some money available. You'll see homeless people walking around with a, a grocery cart full of all their possessions. And it's this just in case scenario. It's the hoarder scenario where they hold onto everything because they can't afford to buy it new. But if you are a digital nomad and you do have a decent income, then if, if you need something, you know, a swimsuit that you've forgotten or an umbrella that you didn't carry with you. You can buy those things for $10 or less, and it's much easier than having to carry those possessions around all the time. Number 10, when you move, it actually takes quite a while to feel comfortable and have your happiness bounce back up. So 
we spend, I don't know, three weeks creatively problem solving, figuring out everything we're going to need to do when we move to a new country. So we're looking for friends. We're looking for a house. We're looking for a nanny. We're looking for our favorite restaurants. We're looking for the public transportation to get us where we need to go. All of these things have to be in place before you can settle into a routine and focus on the things that bring you joy and happiness. So expect to have a bit of a lull in happiness when you move somewhere new. It's going to be a challenge for a while. And Heidi and I, my partner, we really try to keep on top of that, knowing that we're going to be struggling a little bit more to make sure all these things are in place when we move. So that's why we travel three months in a place without moving more frequently. We don't move every week or every day. Final observation, final rant. Uh, I've noticed that even, even though this is not politically correct and a bit ridiculous, I still get upset that people don't speak my language. I'm in Hungary. Not, not as many people speak English here as most of the other places in Europe. And it annoys me. I'll go into a shop and try to buy something and they don't speak English and I don't buy anything. And I think you just lost a sale because you didn't speak my language. Well, of course they can't predict who's going to come in their shop and speak every language. And so it's, you know, you still run into language barriers. And of course you can communicate with miming and you can get good at communicating with people that speak different languages as best you can using body language and things like that. But this problem still hasn't been solved effectively. You can type into Google Translate or you can use one of these speak to translate apps. But a lot of times I'll type in something very, I, you know, I'll use very simple English, like a third grade level or something. And it translates and they look at it and they have no idea what it says. And if you've ever tried translating something from like a, like a song into another language and then back, you'll see that it ends up with all kinds of funny grammatical differences. So there is not a good solution to the language problem yet. And if, if you can solve that, then you would help a lot of people. All right, that's all. That's all 11 points. And I know that's been more than five minutes. This is 12-minute Fridays for you. If you enjoyed this episode or if you found it interesting, please share it with your friends. If you have someone you would recommend it to that might find it useful, I'd love for you to share it. And hop on Instagram and leave a comment on the latest photo I posted. My handle is at Derek Laudermilk. I'm on Instagram pretty much every day. So you can leave a comment there and you will be sure that I will respond. I've been getting quite a few of you showing up on Instagram to have a conversation. So that's really exciting. And you'll be able to check out where in the world I am currently and what's going on. And if you want to check out the show notes for this podcast and other episodes, head to DerekLoudermilk.com. Derek Loudermilk. That's my name. I'm pretty good at saying it sometimes. Thanks so much for listening today. Now it's your turn to go out there and be adventurous. Adventurous.